technology. You gotta love it. Good evening and welcome to Inspire Aldine 2018, coming together over four years to bring you some of the most inspiring educators that Aldine ISD has to offer. Tonight we're gonna hear about challenges. Challenges that have been overcome to bring those same challenges and um, those same problems into the classroom to become strengths, to become passion, to become the same core principles that fuel the speakers that we're going to hear tonight. Their voices become strong due to what they've gone through, and we're going to enjoy hearing how they've turned what many would say would break them into something that has made them stronger. I'm Joshua Hicks, your host for this evening. Uh, I'm with the Aldean Broadcasting Network, and you may have seen our cameras around. Um, we're, gonna, we're out live on YouTube right now, so hello to everybody out there. And I want to challenge each and every one of you to take the ideas that you hear tonight back to your campuses, back to your churches, and back to your communities. Inspire someone there to be greater. And then next year, when the nominations roll out, we want to see someone from your neck of the woods up here on the stage. Tonight, we're going to start off with Coach Johnny Golden. From concrete to the classroom, a father and son's journey. All right, how y'all doing tonight? Let's hear it again for Mr. Hicks, man. He's been doing a great job, man, for about a month now putting this together. Um... I'm Johnny Golden from Davis High School. Uh, I teach math, and believe it or not, I, I coach football. But um, I want to start this thing off a little bit different tonight. I want everybody, if you could give me a shout, I want to hear everybody say team. I want to hear everybody say team. One more time, team. Together, everyone achieves more. We all know this, correct? But I got a new one for you. I got a new one for you, okay? There's one thing that can beat a really good team, and that's a really strong family. So let me hear you say family. family. Let me hear you say family. family. One more time, family. family. Forget about me, I love you. Forget about me, I love you. Now, my story's not about family tonight, but I do have some family in my story, okay? Um, now, when I was asked to... Uh, to get up here, like I said, I was more than, than overjoyed, just excited. I just want, I'm just i very thankful for this opportunity. Uh, Mr. Mr. Caldwell, our building principal, and Mr. Kaplan, thank you all for making this happen. Thanks for believing in me. Uh, it was brought to my attention that the, the four years that they've been doing Inspire Aldine, that there's been a representative from Davis High School each year. So I'm just excited to represent Davis. I'm excited to be here on their behalf, and I hope I live up to their expectations. Um, but let's talk about this word here. Let's talk about inspire for a second. Uh, I'm a math guy, but I'm going to try this real quick. I believe Webster's, and that's you know, Mr. Webster's dictionary, says that to inspire means to encourage, to motivate, um, to move. Um, and it also says something about it, it may be something supernatural or divine. And so I've got to agree with every single part of this. Um, and that's really what the journey is about tonight. Um, First of all, like I said, I wake up every single morning inspired. I love waking up every morning. Uh, my beautiful wife, uh, I'm going to tell you about our morning and how that works. Uh, she is not a coffee drinker, okay? Uh, but she makes a pot of coffee every single morning because she knows that the smell of coffee reminds me of mom and dad. And she had a phenomenal relationship with my mother and my father. And um, she was kind of like the third sister, if you will. Um, and it was great. Uh, I ended up being able to marry my best friend. And uh, we have a phenomenal family. And like I said, it's, it's about forget about me, I love you. And that's really kind of our connection, our relationship. So she makes that coffee every morning on um, my way out. Um, I've got that hot steaming cup of coffee. And once again, mom and dad were coffee drinkers. So I'll pour a little bit out in the yard. And I, and, I, and I say this prayer every morning as I walk to the truck is, Lord, please just allow me to honor my mother and my father today. Please just allow me to encourage and inspire these young men and women that I get a chance that I have an opportunity to work with. And so far, so good. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and, and I'm going to start about uh, maybe what dad meant to me growing up as a young man. Uh, my older brother, he's here tonight, Dr. Golden. If y'all could give it up for him real quick. 
<clears throat> he's the associate principal over at Westfield. Again, we'll talk about how he's important in just a moment. But um, Dr. Golden here and I grew up just a couple of good old boys from Alvin. And uh, I'll be honest with you, man, we didn't know we were poor. We didn't, we didn't realize that we grew up poor, but I'll be honest with you, uh, we knew what family was all about. And uh, Dad was a construction guy. Dad worked construction for 35 years, was a project manager. Um, he was a me mechanical engineer. Um, but before that, he actually played uh, professional football, played for the Houston Oilers back in the 1960s. And um, I tell you what, one thing that I was really proud of is that Dad was a naval aviator as well. He flew the Phantom F-4s uh, in Vietnam. So, you know, he's a lieutenant in the Navy. Um, like I said, he, he was a project manager, he was an engineer, he played professional football. Without a doubt, this guy was, was my true American hero. Um, he's also a cancer survivor. Um, when I was 10 years old, we found out that dad had a bad case of lymphoma, but like I said, the doctors told him, hey, you've got about a 5% chance to survive. And he said that's all he needed to hear because he was an incurable optimist and he knew he was gonna beat it. And good Lord gave him another 20 years. And in those 20 years, I saw this man live with a passion, with a fire that I've seen no one else, <coughs> excuse me, live with. But what touched me or what inspired me, what moved me was not just his passion, but was this incurable optimism, this true sense of forget about me, I love you. That man showed me what it was to be a father. He showed me what it was to be a husband. He showed me what it was to be a friend, okay? And so he set that bar pretty high. And so, like I said, Davis High School, very special place. I work with some phenomenal men and women at Davis High School. Uh, I, I can talk about our math department chair, Shannon DeSantis. She was a finalist for Teacher of the Year this year. She does a phenomenal job there. I love working with her in the department. Uh, like I said, Brad Kaplan, phenomenal job there at Davis. Uh, the leadership we have there with Mr. Caldwell, the, the other administrators, phenomenal. I really enjoy going to work every morning. And I step into that campus at 7 a.m., we're rocking and rolling. We're playing Falcon Fast. Everybody say Falcon Fast. Oh, come on, we got to do better than that. Falcon Fast. Because at Davis, we do things Falcon Fast. And so those guys at Davis, when we, when we step on campus, they're rocking and rolling. And let me tell you about some of the men at Davis campus. We've got a guy that used to play for a Super Bowl champion team. We've got another young man that actually won a state championship in another program. We've even got a, a former All-American. He's in the audience tonight. Let's hear it for old Ryland Bailey. So like I said, we got some phenomenal men on, on campus there. We also have guys from all over the neck of the woods, man. We got a good old boy from Katy. We got another guy or a couple guys from New Orleans. And we even got one coach that's from Chicago. So it's a great staff to work on. Great staff of men. Iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens another. And you know, like I said, borrow that from you know, Proverbs 27, 17, but, but that's really kind of what we believe in. But that's something that dad taught me on the job site, in the, in the construction world at an early age. And I wanted to be nothing more than just like him. I wanted to be an engineer. I wanted to, you know, maybe one day be a professional athlete. I don't know. But I was going to do my very best and try to be like Dad. And so, uh, you know, Dad and I had a really special connection. I got to work on the job site with him, and I learned a lot about construction. But here's the thing. Dad came home every single night smelling like concrete, smelling like the job site. But he always had time after dinner to sit down at the table with me and say, show me what you learned today in that math classroom. Show me what you learned today in physics. And I, and I was excited to show him, and, and, and that's where we really bonded. That's where we really gelled. Sports was great. Dad always had time to coach Little League sports with us, but that bond over the academics is where he and I really, truly bonded, and I love the fact that he always took an interest in that. Okay, so let's fast forward a little bit. So believe it or not, my father's birthday is September 11th. So on September 11th, 2001, I simply call my dad to tell him, happy birthday. And I'm in my last semester of college. My dad was 60 years old, and I find out from him about the events of 9-11 in the World Trade Center. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, my gosh, okay? But my dad, you know, again, was, was very instrumental in, in you know, my, my career path. And once I graduated from college, again, I, I tried to go out and do something in the business world. I tried to go out and, and become a professional athlete. And, and bottom line was it just wasn't there. Something wasn't, wasn't, wasn't clicking. And so finally, that's why I bring up Dr. Golden, okay, who back then was not quite Dr. Golden yet, but he was an assistant principal down there in South Houston. And he challenged me to try teaching. He challenged me to try coaching. And so he got me on as a long-term sub at Dobie High School for one week, teaching Algebra One. and it just so happened it was the first week of spring football. So man, I got to run around like the village idiot out there and hype these kids up, and I fell in love with it. And in the classroom, same thing, it's Algebra One. Everybody knows Y equals MX plus B, right? 
Everybody knows hoi vox, right? Everybody say hoi vox. Oh, come on, like you're cussing at me in German. Hoi vox. Yeah, you don't know that, but the horizontal uh, on the, has a slope of zero, and it's always going to be an equation of y equals a number, or vux is just a vertical asymptote, you know what I'm saying? It's going to be an undefined slope, where x equals... Yeah, you love that. That's stuff I picked up in that algebra classroom. Okay, so I knew that's what I was meant to do, and so I loved it. And so, um, sure, sure enough, I became an eighth-grade math teacher and a little you know, junior high football coach. Dad kept pushing. Keep, keep grinding, son. Keep working. You know, and I just wasn't quite, you know, satisfied with, with that, that seventh grade, eighth grade. But then that's where it starts. You got you to grind and cut your teeth a little bit. So sure enough, I go to dad and I say, well, well you know, they're asking me to, to possibly enlist. I want to go serve my country. I want to, I you know, the, the, they're going over, overseas, dad, and, and, and there's a war, and, and I want to I contribute. And he said, son, and this is coming from a veteran. He said, son, if you truly want to serve your country, you truly want to serve your community, then you teach those young men and women in that classroom. You inspire them to go on and become something great. You work with those young men on that football field. You inspire them to go on and be future husbands and future fathers the right way. So I couldn't, I couldn't you know, ignore that. I couldn't even argue with that. So 2003, like I said, I became a high school, a high school football coach. My first varsity football job, I was more than ecstatic, more than excited. And dad got to make it to one game. And he got to see me coach in a varsity football game. And he was so excited, he came down on the field out, out of the stands after the game was over. But this is where I could tell, Dad, Dad was really sick. The cancer had come back. He did, like I said, good Lord had given him 20 years. But it had come back, and, and I knew his, his, his time was short. His, you know what I'm saying? His days were numbered. And so I, I was able to have one, little, one final conversation with Dad before he passed. And this is what he shared with me. And I'll never forget this. As long as I live, and this is what truly changed my life. This is what truly inspired and moved me. Is he said, son, I worked construction for 35 years. I played professional football. I flew F-4s in Vietnam. I was a, a naval aviator. Let me tell you something, son, right now. If I had to do all over again, I would go back and I would teach high school math and I would coach football. And I was astounded. I was like, you're kidding me. And he said, you've got more of a platform there, more influence at, at that moment, at that platform, in a young man and a young woman's life than anywhere else. And it struck me like a bolt of lightning. And this was in 2003, my, like my dad passed right at the beginning of the year in 2004. But I've been a high school football coach and a math teacher ever since. And I walk out every single morning and I get to work with the nation's best. I get to work with young men like Jeff, Jeff McCulloch and Josh McCulloch, Stephen Hubbard and Tremaine Prudhomme. I get to work with these young men every single day. And I'm gonna tell you something right now, something special going on here at Aldi. Something very special going on here at Alding. But again, it's got to be stronger than team. It's got to be family. Say it with me one more time. Family. One more time. Family. Forget about me. I love you. Thank you all and have a great night. Coach Johnny Golden. By the way, that name just sets it up to scream. Coach Johnny Golden. Our next speaker, Jessica Salazar, is going to share the power of being healthy, wealthy, and wise. Wow. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I am super excited to be here tonight with you. Um, I'm Jessica Salazar. I'm originally from Mexico. I'm the dyslexia specialist at Calvert Elementary. And my journey into education started 14 years ago. And see, back then, the bilingual program wasn't as strong as it is today. So I remember spending endless hours creating my own resources. Uh, my weekends pretty much consisted in just doing lesson plans. Um, I will skip a lot of my conference times just to work with those students that needed that extra help. And lunches for me was sitting in front of my computer, just maybe grabbing a bag of chips or some cookies so that I could catch up with everything that I had to do. So I remember driving home feeling completely exhausted. Obviously, I stopped exercising, I was eating pretty bad, I had problems sleeping, and I was totally hooked to caffeine. And somehow, the next morning, I had to be, in, in, with all this energy, to be in front of my 23 students and Johnny. See, Johnny was this little sweet energizer bunny that went on and on and on and on, and I just couldn't catch up with him. Back then, I was living in such a rush 
that I stopped smiling. I stopped really connecting authentically with teachers, with my students, with people in my life. And that's when I knew I had to do something different. I could no longer put myself last. And I understood that the responsibility of taking care and loving myself was completely mine. So I went into this journey of educating and arming myself with a set of tools that would not allow me to stay stuck in that stressful and unproductive way. So the first thing I knew I had to do was somehow to bring some energy into my life, right? So I'm doing all this research and it says that exercise is the easiest and fastest way of gaining energy. Well, there was a little tiny problem. I was exhausted. I had no energy, right? So it's like, oh my God, how am I gonna do this? So I did a very conservative plan where I was exercising once a week for two weeks. That was it. Then I moved to twice a week, three times a week, you get the idea, and then three times, four, and it was like, okay, I can do this. And then I started eating, eating much better. I make sure that I was hydrating myself and eating all those veggies and, and, and fruit and healthy grains, right? And I really saw a change in myself. I mean, my energy was boosting, but even though I was feeling good, there were days and perhaps weeks that I wasn't able to do this. And then the little chatter started, and I started to be very harsh, I kind of like bullying myself for not being able to do this. Um, so the next thing I needed to do, or take control really, was my mind. See, I needed to start seeing things as they were and not bigger than they were. So let me give you an example. Back then, I will say things like, um, my God, you know, I am so stressed out. I promise you I've never been this stressed out. I mean, I feel like literally I'm drowning. If I have to do one more report, right, teachers, one more, I know I'm going to die, right? So this is the thing. Words create a reality. And I was choosing words that were not a very, like, supporting a very good reality for me. So I decided to challenge those thoughts. And I said, Jessica, and I really had a conversation with myself. Jessica, are you really drowning? I mean, are you really gonna die if you make one more report? Or is it that you just have a full day? Or maybe just a full week? And it wasn't until I was able to separate myself from those thoughts that I created momentum. I wasn't giving any energy to that stress that I had, and instead I started to take action. And the last thing I noticed is that the way that I was starting my day will determine how my day rolled or went, right? So uh, if I was snoozing all the time, if I were waking up tired, or it was in a rush, the rest of my day wasn't very good. So I decided to adopt a very strong morning routine. And I'm just gonna share a few of the things that I do because I just have seven minutes. Uh, so something that I do, I not only exercise in the morning, but I also set an intention for my day. See, an intention is nothing else than something that you want to put all your focus on. You know, so I wake up and I say, what is my why? What is it that I'm gonna live today for? And it could be, Laughter, it could be contribution, it could be communication. Today was connection. Um, so I do that. And then I have a little notepad next to me, and I write my top three things that I want to accomplish that day. And these three things are non-negotiable, because I know if those three things happen, I'm gonna have a pretty successful day. And then I like to practice gratitude. And the way that I do it is I just close my eyes, and I bring my hands to my heart. And I just think of someone that has affected my life in a positive way, that has contributed to my life. And I really, really give thanks for that person. And then I think of an experience that had brought me so much joy and, and laughter, and I just try to relieve that experience. And finally, I just give thanks for something that I have in my life, that have just, life have just given to me. And I just sit there for a couple of minutes. And that single tool, guys, will put you in such a happy and beautiful state 
that it's hard to have a hard day, right? Or it's just going to be easier. But why do I give you or why do I tell you all of this? And it's because as teachers, we're givers, we're nurturers. And most of the time, we tend to put everything and everyone in front of us. And I don't know how is it working for you, but it wasn't working for me. And it wasn't until I took responsibility of my own life that I became a better person, a better educator, a better co-worker. So today I'm excited to share with you that for several years I get comments such as, Miss Salazar, you know, you're always so happy and you're so energized, but at the same time you're so peaceful and relaxed. It's like, whatever you are doing, I need to start doing. So um, this year, I'm super excited to say that at Calvary Elementary, we have our first meditation uh, club. So in the morning, we, some of us just uh, take 15 minutes to meditate, to set an intention, and to start our day in a more mindful way. And with my students, I'm always planting the seed of self-respect and self-love and accountability. So our days start very different uh, every day. Sometimes we start dancing. Sometimes we share successes. Sometimes we practice gratitude, or one of my favorites, we bring our superhero inside of us. And all of these, those, all of these tools allow my students to connect to that happy and beautiful state where anything is possible. Learning becomes possible. Oh, and by the way, remember Johnny? Johnny is still my student. We have a very good relationship. So he keeps coming with me, right? <laughs> Dyslexia. So. Um, the big difference with Johnny, because he still goes on and on and on, but the difference is that most of the time, I'm able to catch up with him. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Salazar. Uh, I don't know about y'all, but I started my day by stepping into two inches of really cold water. Thank goodness for Starbucks. On the stage next, somebody who's become kind of close to me here lately. I, I, I spend a lot of mornings getting up and going to find him to get a, a little shot of energy. Mr. Anthony Cobb from Carver High School is going to come to the stage and talk to us about accepting the unspoken gratitude of a challenging student. Good evening. Well, obviously, thank all of you all for coming out and for everything that you do in our lives. We thank you. And I just take a moment and I want you to feel that gratitude. Thank you. My name is Anthony Cobb. I teach professional communication at Carver High School for Applied Sciences, Architecture, Engineering, Visual Arts, and Performing Arts. That's not a list. That is our entire name. Please look us up because we're doing some amazing things on an amazing campus with some amazing people. I have some really good days. I also uh, coach the speech and debate team. I have had some great successes. I've also had some struggles. But the struggles don't beat me down because I believe that we are a reflection. We are the face of our families, our friends, our colleagues, and our struggles. People are watching how we move in those circles. And how we move in those circles inspire people. I have a magic phrase for those times when I'm struggling. I always tell people, I don't have bad days. I have bad moments. But I have a lot of student debt, and I didn't get that student debt majoring in puppetry or letting somebody make me their puppet. So you can ruin my moment. I'll give you that, but you can't have my day. So what do I do to get through those struggling moments? What I do is I have a magic phrase. It's something that my mother taught me when I was a kid. It's something that she continued to tell me all throughout my adolescence and even into my adulthood. It's a simple phrase and I call it my magic phrase. Have you ever thought about what your magic phrase would be? Very simple, consider the source. That's it, consider the source. That would turn out to be the common thread that would sew and keep my life together. I live by that, I live in that and I live through that, consider the source. We have to get to the root of why negative things happen. And when we get to the root of why things happen, when we get to the root of systems, processes, even negativity, we have an opportunity to transform negative into positive. And don't we need more of that in this world? 
more positive. So that simple phrase I've carried with me my entire life, and it has allowed me to not make a fool of myself in certain situations. It has transformed as well as strengthened my interpersonal relationships, and it has given me peace, as well as the ability to spread peace in the world wherever I go. So I thank you for that, Mom. A simple phrase. Now, how do I apply that on the job? Well, I work with a great group of kids, but they don't always have a good day. We can have a bad day, but we can't show up. We have to fake it until we, right? We don't have the opportunity to come in there and say, oh, I had a horrible day. Today, y'all gonna write till my fingers get tired. We don't have that opportunity. We have to go in there and just act like everything is just wonderful and I disappear at three o'clock and I just turn into vapor. I've got no problems, I've got no struggles. And then you have that one kid, when you are coming to work and you're just in the zone and you're in there working and you're teaching and you're being dynamic and effective and it's working, except for this one kid who's only, and I mean his only purpose in life is to bring you down. When this happens, because sometimes children, you know, they're having a bad day and they're gonna let you know that they're having a bad day. Okay? They've got some very colorful words. And they call me some of those colorful words. They call my mama some of those colorful words. So no matter what they have called me or called my mama, the human in me wants to black out and get on their level. Actually, they're in high school, so to get on their level. But as a friend of mine says, I like to fit in the 20th, amen? So I have to, and I'll ask the student, did you eat today? Wait, <laughs> did you eat today? And there's usually one or two answers and the most popular answer is nope. I'm not a math person, but we just solve for X because I know that my energy and my actions did not equate, did not deserve what just got hurled at me. So I'm like, okay, the other question, I mean, the other answer I'll get from the student is, yeah, I ate, well, what did you eat? A bag of hot fungus and an Arizona iced tea. Again, we solve for X, we now know what is at the root of the problem. So I'll give the kid a pass, and sometimes that pass is attached to a granola bar. And I tell them, go to the water fountain, wash it down. And the kids tell me, well, our water fountain tastes like Gravy. Well, you shall never go hungry again because gravy's coming out the pipes. But the kid comes back and they may not know how to say thank you, but they cannot harness that energy and that love that comes from them that tells you thank you. And the kid comes back to my class and is changed, is appreciative, and is your biggest advocate. Sit down, he's talking. You better get your books out. All because you stopped this child's stomach from touching his back. And he is no longer just thinking about that. He is now engaged. You have to look beyond. You have to consider the source. Go deep in there. Because kids are hide a lot of stuff deep in there. And you gotta get that out of there. So I'm grateful for my mother who taught me that. Now, school. I love school, I teach school, I loved every year of school. Let me tell you about kindergarten. I loved kindergarten so much that I did it twice. I failed kindergarten, y'all. How? I'm gonna answer that in just a little bit. Because I showed up every single day, and if they weren't making um, some type of an art project, if they weren't cooking, singing, or dancing, I came in there and I just laid on the assistant teacher's lap and I cried and cried and cried. <laughs> Are they cooking? I did what I wanted to do, but not what I had to do. So they thought something was wrong with me. Now, I was a student. I was that student, y'all, with ADHD, a great immune system, and perfect attendance. I showed up come hell or high water, and I literally mean that. There was no excuse for missing school. My parents said there's only one reason you'll miss school, and that's a death in the family, and that death had better be yours. <laughs> Needless to say, I never died while I was in school, so I showed up every day. I kept showing up, whether you wanted me to or not. I kept coming. So 
I went home for the summer, didn't think about kindergarten, didn't even think about going to the first grade. But the first day of school, which should have been my first day of first grade, my mother says, hey, Tony, how was the first grade? And I said, Mom, I don't know because I'm still in kindergarten. But I didn't care because they were painting and they were cooking and they were singing and they were dancing. Let's do this again. If looks could kill, I died three times right there because my mother was like, what? The next thing I know, I'm laying face up on a tire swing at John Muir Elementary School while my mother and dad raked the administrators and the teachers over the coals. And my mother says, how does my child fail kindergarten? My mother's a woman of faces. And she says, better yet, how does my child fail kindergarten? And I don't know. Come to find out, there was no paper trail. For some reason, they didn't do any formal assessments. It was an informal assessment. They just thought since I showed up and cried when I didn't want to do what I didn't want to do, something wrong. Let's make him do it again. So my mother said, give him some tests and get him in the first grade. The next thing I know, I'm in Ms. Pagano's first grade class, and I saw it through, like I did all my elementary school classes. I get to fifth grade, and this was a tumultuous year. I met Johnny Mathis. My family just moved to Texas. Culture shock. After knowing me three days, Mr. Johnny Mathis pulls open this literature book that had plays in it. And he gave every student a part in that play. And I'll never forget the look on his face. He said, wait, Anthony? After he had given me a bit part, he said, I'm gonna change this. I'm gonna give you the lead in this play. I think you can do it. After three days of knowing me, he knew there was more to me than this child that couldn't stop bouncing off the walls, eating and picking his fingernails. He looked beyond. When everybody else was throwing their hands up, he looked beyond. If I had a dollar for every time somebody did this, every time a teacher did that, I'd have $47 and really so low self-esteem. After knowing me for three days, this man looked past that. He also gave me a puppy because I didn't know that he actually knew my mother. He gave me a puppy. I named that puppy Pooch, brown Labrador. That puppy loved me so much. Puppy would take my sister and brother to school, walk them to the highway, come back down, pick me up and walk me to the highway to go to school, and would meet me on that highway. That dog transformed my relationships with my siblings, made me a better person at home, made me a better student, I wanted to do everything Mr. Mathis asked me to do because he looked beyond my quirks. He looked beyond everything that people said was wrong with me and said, you can do it. And I knocked on Mr. Mathis's door 28 days later and he said, Anthony Cobb, get in here. He yelled at me, (laughs) but he remembered my name after 28 years. He never forgot me and he told the same stories that I had been telling for almost 30 years about the puppy and the lead in the play. You could have bought me for a penny. Because I always have a good cry queued up, so look out front row. We've got to consider the source. I do what I do because of people like that, that loved me. Not because they taught me, but because they loved me. Because they gave me a chance, and they taught me how to transform a negative situation into a positive situation. And y'all, I teach a group of kids that have a lot of situations. Don't always have the tools to transform them. Everybody around them is doing this, giving up on them. At Aldine, we produce the nation's best. And in order to produce the nation's best, you've got to inspire. In order to inspire, you've got to look beyond the surface and consider the source. I thank you all for being here. I have one last thing I would like to show you. Don't get scared. That's called the victory pose. When we talk about considering the source, what's the source of your inspiration? I get kids that don't want to speak, that don't want to compete, and I teach them the victory pose. This, making your body larger than what it actually is, making it take up more space, reduces your cortisol, which causes you to stress and shake. It increases your testosterone. So the next time you go to a job interview, the next time you're on the stage, get in the toilet and do Thank you, I'm Anthony Cobb. Thank you. Mr. Anthony Cobb, 
I think I misunderstood him. I, I didn't make poses. I just kept eating the burritos. <laughs> Next, we're going to have Betzabel de la Rosa. And she's going to share, what do we have to be afraid of? Good evening. Hello. My name is Betzabel de la Rosa. I am a third grade bilingual teacher from Carmichael. Yay, Cougars! I am very honored to be here today and thank you for joining us. I would like to take this opportunity to thank my the principal, Mrs. Doxdeo, the administrators, teachers, and staff. Ms. Wheeler, thank you for uh, your vote of confidence in me. Thank you so much. Also, I would like to take this opportunity to thank my husband, Eduardo, my son, Alan, my son, Isaac, because without their unconditional love and support for me, I could not do what I do. This past year alone, I must have spent at least 100 hours of extracurricular activities, meaning outside of the classroom, at school, instead of being with them. So I thank you guys for your love and support, and thank you for giving me wings. <laughs> mommy, no, mommy, you can do this. Mommy, 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 focus. Mommy, you got this. Mommy, you can do this. So a few years ago, my family and I went to do a rope challenge course. We were all excited, and I booked the tickets online. Oh, my God, this is going to be so much fun, and it's really great. Well, we get there, we got harnessed in, Woohoo! we're doing this. Everything was perfect. Well, the higher you go up on the, cor uh, the rope course, the more challenging that it gets. I was at the very top. There was one course in front of me, only one rope here and one rope here. And I'm standing on a little platform and suddenly, the excitement disappeared. Suddenly, I'm looking at this rope in front of me. I'm thinking, there's no way. My hands started sweating. My heart started beating really fast. I was stricken by fear. I literally could not move. <sighs> I'm thinking, maybe I should just go back. But I couldn't because there was people behind me. And then I'm thinking, oh, my God. What happens if I get stuck? Who's going to rescue me? I don't want to be the crazy lady dangling from the rope. Help me. Plus, I didn't want to embarrass my family. But most importantly, I was afraid of failing. I was afraid, and I kept hearing very loud noises in my head. What if you fall? You can't do this. And then suddenly my son comes to the rescue. Mommy! Mommy, come down, Mommy. You can do this. I know you can. I have faith in you, Mommy. Mommy, relax. Mommy, breathe. And suddenly the loud noises I was hearing in my head, the negative, he came to a whisper. He started to die down. And all I could hear was my son cheering for me. And all I could hear was my son saying, Mommy, you can do this. So, okay. I close my eyes. One foot in front of the other. And I'm holding for dear life. And I literally closed my eyes. I was trusting the sense of my feet. And the loud noise was just a whisper. And all I could hear, Mommy, come on, Mommy, you can do that. You're almost there. And I'm closing my eyes. Suddenly I hear really loud, Mommy! I'm like, open my eyes. He goes, You made it. I go, Oh, you mean I didn't fall down? When I got to the other side, I literally started to cry. But it was tears of joy. I was so excited. I overcame my fear. Most importantly, I did not quit. I finished what I started. 
but I could not have done it if my son was not pushing me. I could not have done it if he was cheering me on. Ladies and gentlemen, I am a firm believer of positive encouragement. I am a firm believer of using kind, positive words. Our students need that kind of language. Just like I was afraid for no reason, because I was harnessed in, I am sure that our students are afraid of taking risk. Our students are afraid of trying something new. It is our job as educators to push them, to motivate them, to make them believe in themselves. In my classroom, that is the kind of language that I use. We sing and we dance. We celebrate each other's successes. Can I get a whoop whoop? Again, can I get a whoop whoop? For the past four years, I have been very involved in the chess club. And I had a student who was scared of the game. How can you be scared of chess? But he was. And I saw the potential in him. He was very analytical, and I knew that he would be a great player. Come on, hey, come, I want you to join. No, Mr. La Rosa, you know, I, no, I'm okay. Come on. Come to the, the meetings after school. I'll, I'll teach you. It's okay. Oh, okay, well, I'll ask permission. Oh, don't worry. I already called your mom. She says you're staying. <laughs> okay, I guess. So he stayed. He's like, oh, oh, and how, what is that piece called? And how do you move that? So slowly by slowly, you know, surely I started enticing him, and I kept encouraging him. He was getting better, and I said, hey, I challenge you to a game. He's like, okay. Well, he won, right? His confidence just lifted up the roof, and he said, what? I beat Miss De La Rosa? He was telling everybody, hey, guys, I beat Miss De La Rosa. Man, I beat the teacher in chess. So then I said, okay, fine. He got better. The next time I actually challenged him, he actually did win. Last year, my school participated in four, four different city-wide, city-wide competitions. And the kid that was nervous and scared and did not want to play chess because he was afraid of failing, came home with a trophy every single tournament. Can I get a whoop whoop? Can I get a whoop whoop? On the last tournament, he comes to me with the trophy. And he, he's so excited, and he hugs me. Miss De La Rosa, I won. I go, sweetheart, I know. Miss De La Rosa, I just want to say thank you for believing in me and for pushing me to be better. Powerful words, ladies and gentlemen. A few years ago, I had another student who loved spending time with me. Before school, after school, specials, tutoring, Saturday school, you name it. We were joined at the hip. And I kept working with her. In third grade, I'm teaching her basic sight words. I'm teaching her phonemics, third grade. So one day she was in a bad mood and she tells me, Miss De La Rosa, why do you make me work so hard? You know, I'm never going to learn. Everybody at home, they say that I'm stupid. I stopped what I was doing. Came across the table. I gave her a hug. And I said, sweetheart, just because learning is hard for you does not mean that you're stupid. I don't think you're stupid. We're going to work together. And you're going to get better. I promise you. The year went on. We kept working together. It was making small gains. And I was, it was towards the end of the year. I was feeling the stress. I was having one of those days where you feel like everything you do doesn't matter. I was tired, overworked, feeling underappreciated, and really wondering, is this really bad? I mean... I'm killing myself. Am I really making a difference? I found on my desk 
a little note for my student. Open it up. Ms. De La Rosa, I just want to say thank you for believing in me and for making me feel smart. Ms. De La Rosa, thank you for making me feel smart. Powerful words. You can't buy that in a textbook. It's called love. It's called believing. It's called sharing the positivity, positive words of encouragement. So I was very fortunate to work with another student who was having some hygiene issues. And she came from a very large family, so her basic needs were not being met. Didn't really come to school very often, had a nasty attitude. So she wasn't always looking her best. I talked to her, I tried every other way to motivate her. Come on, let's get to, to doing this, you got it. Mm -mm. So then it occurred to me. I bought her a bag of goodies. I bought her toothpaste, toothbrush, a comb, hairbrush, pins, a deodorant, a scented lotion. And every single day, I made a deal with her. When you come into my classroom, you go to the restroom, take care of yourself, and come back. <sighs> Fine. Give me the attitude. Do I really have to? Yes, sweetheart, you do. And we did this every day. And every time she came out of the classroom, the restroom, I would say, you know what? You're looking good today. Wow, look at you. Are you ready to learn? Now that you're looking really great, you're going to be great today. You promise me? Okay, Ms. De La Rosa, whatever. So we started this process. And the reason she did not want to take her care package home, because she was afraid her mother or her brothers would throw it away. It was her little treasure. And would you know, a couple of weeks, she started standing taller. She started smiling more. She had friends. And would you know, she started doing her work. She stopped missing school as much. I motivated her by meeting and giving her her basic needs. Basic needs. One day, she comes running to me and she tells me, Ms. De La Rosa, do you know why I like being in your class? No, oh, sweetheart, tell me. Ms. De La Rosa, I like being in your class because you make me feel beautiful. I made her look beautiful. I made her look beautiful. Teach through example. Teach from the heart. The rest will follow. Everybody stand up. Put your hands up in the air, the right hand. Press it over. Say, I matter. Say like you mean it. Turn around. The person behind you, say, you make a difference. <laughs> say it again like you mean it. You make a difference. Okay, you may sit down. So, ladies and gentlemen, I can honestly say I came. I got a standing ovation. I turned... I turn your world around, and hopefully, I touched your heart. Thank you, Ms. De La Rosa. Up next, Alejandro De La Pena is going to share the source for where he finds the strength to teach 
the nation's best. Hi. Before I start, I'd like to say that my message isn't for you that came today. It's really more for the parents, for the kids, young people that maybe are going the wrong path and having a hard time. I'd like to start by reading something that I wrote recently. I lost a shoe as my mom carried me across the Rio Grande to get to the U.S. My father left us when I was too young to inherit his role for my younger siblings. We lived in the highest gang, crime, and drug-infested projects for more than half my life. We were shot at, carjacked, and threatened to be kidnapped in the drug wars a few years ago. My family, friends, and role models were driven by this lifestyle. Many lost their life to it. All that was normal to me. And then it became normal for me to have run-ins with the law. I went from GT to want to be OG, to struggling freshman, to decorated with honors, first generation college grad, to here. I let a lot of people down, but many more pushed me along the way, especially like my wife, Alicia. That's just me. I wrote this for my application for a teacher of the year at Odom Elementary. My story is not perfect. It's full of constant failure and loss, but it made me. Looking back though, I can say that imperfection is beautiful. Failing over and over is inspiring. But unfortunately, a little white casket gave me my passion. Four years ago, I started working at Aldi. But before that, I was an expert in food stamps, public housing, and Medicaid. I was not a social worker. I was born into poverty, and it took me more than 30 years to rise out of those challenges. I was born and raised in El Paso, Juarez, Texas, and Mexico. Soy de El Chuco, Juaritos. After graduating from high school back in 1997, I like to tell people that I took this. It took me more than 11 years to get to college. I was a good student when I was growing up. I was even offered two full scholarships. But I didn't know how to do college. No one in my family had ever gone to college. No one had even finished high school. I was proud that I finished high school. It made me feel smart. Plus, I was young, I was strong. I didn't need college, I thought. I started working fast food jobs, started getting some money. I had a beautiful girlfriend, now she's my wife. I thought... <laughs> I thought I had it made. I thought I had figured life out, but I was really wrong. Five years after graduating from high school in 2002, me and my girlfriend were expecting our first baby. Life was very good. I was going to be a dad. Named them Leon Alejandro. Like me. He lived three days. And I remember I, ha I had to go identify him at the morgue. I wanted to pick him up.
and hug them back to life. I just was not strong enough. Life broke me. I got mad. I spiraled out of control for a few years after that. I knew I had to change. I didn't know how. But life continued. It didn't stop. So four years later, we had our second son, Ariel. And I was so scared to lose him too. I knew he deserved better than what I had become. He was my second chance. He was, it was the time where I didn't have, I could not mess it up anymore. It was time to suck it up. But I didn't, I didn't have a guiding light to follow. I had to reach inside myself and learn how to shine to give my family a bright future. So, reaching deep down inside myself, I, I lit a fire that still guides me today. Two years after that, in 2008, I challenged myself and I started going to the University of Texas at El Paso, UTEP. Four years after that, I graduated with my bachelor's and we had our beautiful daughter, Anaciel. A year after that, in 2013, I got my master's. I was shining, I was on a roll. I had beat my biggest challenge myself. A few months after that, Aldine hired me. And they said they were produce, producing the nation's best, that they had lots of technology and that they promoted innovation. To me, it was my new challenge. So I took that and ran with it. So now in my classroom, we write code for robots. We read schematics to build rovers. We fly drones. We even do 3D printing. In fact, we even have our own version of the Aldean Broadcasting Network. We interviewed our iTech, Ms. Lester, which is here, um, and it was awesome. My kids are amazing. They really are leaders in technology in the district. Truly the nation's best. And this is where people get surprised. I am an SLC teacher at Odom Elementary, which means I have kids with autism, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, intellectual disabilities, and many more severe conditions. They are perfectly beautiful little human beings that have taught me to cherish the little things in life as a teacher. Like walking, like talking. Some of my students can't talk. Some can't walk. But they try and try harder after each failure. They never give up. It's inspiring. Then, my students, along with my kids, Ariel, Anasiel, come here. They gave me the inspiration that I need when I feel that everything is going wrong. They make me feel like I can do anything, I can be the best, and I'm not perfect. I've made big mistakes. I wish nobody would have to do the things that I did. But you don't have to be perfect. Mistakes are okay. Just keep fighting. Don't give up. And be the best you can be for somebody who deserves it. It might be your students, it might be your children, it might be your family, your mom, your dad, whoever it is that inspires you, do it for them. And I promise you, 
You will do it. Thank you. Mr. De La Pena. Next we have Mr. Gerald Williams. He's going to talk to us a little bit about dreams. I know a little bit of something about dreams. They don't always match where you end up. I'm in Texas. I never thought I'd be here. This was not where I dreamed I'd be. Mr. Gerald Williams is going to talk to you all about how dreams don't always match your work ethic. Before I get started, give the, the other speakers a hand. I think they've done an awesome job. Man. I, I, feel, I feel very inspired by a lot of things that were said. Um, I start my, my speech with, my mom used to tell me this all the time. She used to say, Gerald, baby, you can be whatever you want to be. And, and through the challenges of life, I, I quickly figured out that you can really only be what you're willing to work for. You, you can really only be what you're willing to make sacrifices for. You can really only be what you're willing to able overcome adversity for. That's what you can really be. And that's the message that I bring to my students every day. And so I challenge you tonight with three things to take away. Teach your kids or your students to have a dream. But only don't teach them just to have a dream. Teach them how to overcome adversity because adversity is going to come. But only don't teach them that. Teach them to believe in themselves. And that's another message that, again, that I bring to my kids because we teach college and career readiness. We're trying to get our kids ready for life, and they have to create a four-year plan starting in the eighth grade. What classes do you need to take in the ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth to become this dream? that you say you want to be. And before we get started, I always ask these two questions. What is your dream, and does your work ethic match it? Because a lot of them will say, Mr. Williams, I want, I want to be an engineer. I want to be an attorney. I want to be a lawyer. And then I say, show me your work ethic. Show me do you put the work in enough to make this thing happen, because if you don't put the work in, it won't happen. And so the ones that struggle with, with work ethic, I tell them this story. I say, I remember when my wife got pregnant with our first kid. I used to rub her stomach and say, babe, I, I just want to hear how she sounds. I, I just want to hear what she's going to be like. I just want to help her with her dream. And I tell them, I say, your mom used to do the, the very same thing. She used to have positive dreams for you. This is going to be the new attorney. This is going to be the next engineer. This is going to be the next doctor. She never rubbed her stomach and said, ooh, you're going to be that bad kid. <laughs> yeah, you're going to be that one I got to go to the school all the time. You're going to be so bad. I said, she never would say that about you. And so I asked you this morning, are you bringing dreams back home or are you bringing nightmares? Because before you had a dream for yourself, somebody else had a, a, had a dream for you. And I, I try to get them to understand this is the step one to doing what you say you want to do. And so after a couple of months passed, we're working on our four-year plans. We're, we're putting the classes in so that they can get their, their, their high school plans together to go to the ninth grade. And a young lady says, Mr. Williams, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to do my, my four-year plan. And I go back there and I talk to her and I say, so, so what do you want to be? She says, I want to be an FBI agent. She said, but Mr. Williams, I remember a couple of months ago, you were saying that, that your mom had dreams for you. She said, Mr. Williams, you don't know this because I don't tell this to everybody, but I'm a foster kid. You see, I, I've, never, I've never met my, my mom, Mr. Williams, but, but, but the other day, I got a chance to find her. I, I, got, I found her phone number, Mr. Williams, and, and I called her up, and I wanted to just ask mom, how did this happen? How did me and my brother end up? in foster care. But before I could have any words come out of my mouth, Mr. Williams, she said to me, how did you find me? How did you find my number? See, I didn't want you and your brother then, and I don't want you now. Mr. Williams, who has dreams for me? Who, who, who should I work so hard for, Mr. Williams? Because she don't love me. 
And so that brings to my point number two. I say, listen, adversity is going to come. I said, there's going to be some times in your life that you're going to drive home after you get this job and you're going to sit in the car and wonder, why did this have to happen? I say, but what you need to be, you need to be the mom for the little girl that you may have that you never had in your life. You, you, you be the mom for the little boy that you may have that you never had in your life. And I say, you know, life is kind of like a deck of cards. I say, it's kind of like the game of spades. I know you don't know, you don't know the game of spades, but I say, people deal you a hand, and you look in your hand, and, and you may say, I, I can't work with this. I, 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 can't, I can't do anything with this. I said, but in the game of spades, you got a partner. I say, in the game of space, it's almost like life. I'm your partner. These teachers here on this campus, they are your partners. We have dreams for you. So what I need you to do is not quit on yourself. Continue to move forward. And when adversity comes, I say, it's okay to cry. I tell my kids all the time, I say, listen, if you start crying, go in the bathroom, snot it out, yell it out, get it all out. But here's the thing, do not quit. Get right back up and keep moving forward so you can become the best you that you need to be. I had another kid that talked to me about hard. He said, Mr. Williams, I want to be an engineer. I said, okay. What's your math grade look like? Oh, man, I, I quit math. <laughs> I, don't, I don't do math, Mr. Williams. It's, it's too hard, Mr. Williams. I said, listen, you don't quit something because it's hard. I say, what well, really, what, what it is, when hard shows up in your life, it's life telling you, how bad do you really want this engineering degree? How bad do you want it? So, so you're telling me you're going to let a little math class keep you from getting this engineering degree. I said, let me, let me tell you a quick little story. I say, you know, my, my wife, when we were still dating in college, she told me she wanted to be an attorney. And I remember going to the library with her one day, and she said, listen, I got to type this 20-page paper for this English class. And we're in that library, and she's typing, and I'm looking at magazines, and all of a sudden, the power go. She's on page 17, and all her work is gone. She starts looking at the screen like, I, I can't believe this. Oh, oh my gosh, she starts crying, and, and I want to go over and, and, and put my hand on her shoulder and say it's going to be okay, but I really don't believe that. And she starts crying, and, and, and I'm trying to think of, what do I tell her right now? Because this may keep her from going to law school. And she dries her tears, and, and she puts her hands together. And, and I, she didn't say anything, but I see in her eyes her saying, my dream was to be an attorney. And she pushes the power button and starts right back tight. What I tell my kids is adversity is going to come. But again, it's only there to see what are you willing to do to make the dream happen. And so I, I, I always tell them, listen, all you have to do is don't quit. Don't give up. Keep moving forward. And the last thing I teach them is to believe in themselves. I say, listen, let me tell you how much power you have. I always say, I say, listen, look around in my room. Everything you see in this classroom started in somebody's mind. I see nothing that you see, your clothes you have on, the desk you're sitting in, the board, somebody thought of that, and their mind is no better than yours. I tell them, I say, listen, you, you maybe never, never heard of this guy, but this guy named Les Brown, right? He was walking down the hallway with his friend one time, and the teacher called him and his friend into the room. And the teacher said, hey, uh, Mr. Brown, can you, can you do that work? And he said, oh, excuse me, wait a minute, I'm not, I'm not your student. He, he's your student. He said, I heard you. But can you do the problem that's on the board? And the students start laughing. They said, hold on, mister, that's, his name is DT. And he's like, what does that mean? Oh, uh, that's the dumb student. Now, he, he's the dumb twin because he had a twin brother. He's the dumb twin, mister. He can't do that work. He said, listen, can you do the problem, Mr. Brown? He said, oh, no, sir, I, I really can't because, you know, I'm spared, too. He said, listen, son, you don't have to be what people say you are. You just have to believe in you. He said it changed his whole life because he realized as long as he believed in himself, it's hard for you to stop me. He, he, said, he said, listen, after that, he started going after things. And if you've ever seen Les Brown, he's a motivational speaker. He's been doing this whole life. Why? Because he believes in himself. And so I tell you this. 
Teach your kids to have a dream. Teach your kids how to overcome adversity. And teach your kids to believe in themselves. Thank you. That's my time. Mr. Gerald Williams, everyone. I have a dream. I want to be a skinny donut taster. That's my dream. He's inspired me. Yeah, work ethic, that's right. Up next, up next, we have the principal of Reed Academy. By the way, just wanted to pause there for drama. I want to thank all the people that are out there watching because I'm getting a lot of texts and social media. There are people watching. No pressure, Miss Adams. Up next, the principal of Reed Academy, Miss Gina Morrison Adams who's going to talk about not fearing being greater. story this is my song making things greater looking for better seeking for greater all the day long Gina Gina, oh, there you are, girl. What is this? What is this, an acceptance letter from Texas A&M? Gina, I cannot afford to send you to Texas A&M. And your sister said, it's over three hours away from Warren, Texas. And besides, you're my baby. I want you here with me. I am so proud of you, girl. In a couple of weeks, you're going to graduate from Woodville High School at the top of your class. But mama, I have to go to Texas A&M. I need to go to Texas A&M. I want to go to Texas A&M. And I've already been accepted. And besides, Mama, it's the only school that I applied to. I promise, if you let me go, I'll make things better for you. I'll make things greater for us. I won't get pregnant. I won't embarrass you. I'll do my best. See, what you don't know is that I was born and raised the baby of eight children in a dysfunctional family with frequent moves, with very hard economic times. In fact, we moved every 18 months from Lufkin, Texas to Warren, Texas. And in the middle of that year, we'd move back to Warren. And we did this backwards and forwards. I knew by the time that I was nine years old, how many yellow stripes from Lufkin, Texas to Warren, Texas. 63.4 miles. 
And because of these frequent moves and the unstable and mostly dysfunctional home life, I didn't stand out amongst my peers. In fact, I struggled. I had a difficult time focusing. I had dyslexia when they hadn't even labeled it dyslexia. I saw the word stop. I read tops. My mother, she did her best to raise the eight children that she had. Her goal for us, for her six daughters and her two sons, was that we graduated from high school, the girls without getting pregnant, and the boys to graduate without getting somebody else's daughter pregnant. My mother had a third grade education. She had to leave school to go into the cotton fields to help her mother, her father, her younger siblings. So when she stated, Gina, I'm proud of you for graduating at the top of your class, that meant something because it was milestone and I wasn't pregnant. But round by round, I kept falling through the cracks, getting further and further and further back because of the frequent moves. The curriculum, the scope and sequence in Lufkin was different than the curriculum, the scope and sequence in Warren. And so there were so many gaps and I kept falling further and further back through the cracks. But as a young girl, I always had a desire to do better and to do greater. My ninth grade science teacher, Ms. Giles, came by the lab site one day. And she said, Gina, you're college material. I don't know how many other students she spoke those five words to, but to me, those five words, Gina, you are college material, was earth shattering, was life breathing, was empowering. From that day of desire, of empowerment, of desire of greater and better, filled my entire being. So my mother, after much, much, much hesitation and a lot of anxiety, she allowed me to go to Texas A&M. But when I got there, although I had graduated in the top 10% of my class from Woodville High School, I wasn't ready for Texas A&M to be one of 412 students in English 101, to be one of 285 students in chemistry. I felt like I was just the number and my professors made me realize, yes, you are just the number. What is your ID number? Not what is your name? In fact, I struggled so bad. Now, you all don't tell Ms. Stockwell and Dr. Bamberg and the Board of Trustees this, but at the end of my second semester, I had a whopping 1.0 GPA. 
I had to go to the dean's office. And Dr. Woodrow Woody Jones, the dean of liberal arts, he looked at me. And he said, Gina, you know this is not going to do. What's your plan? I told him, I said, Dr. Jones, I'm greater than what you see on the paper. I'm better than that. He said, I believe you. But for right now, you can't be at Texas A&M. So with his encouragement, his advice, his directive, becoming that father figure that I really didn't have, He advised me to go to Blinn Junior College in Bryan, Texas. I went there for four semesters, got myself together, settled down, graduated with honors with an Associate of Arts degree. And Dr. Jones told me before I left his office that day, he said, if you make two consecutives, 4.0, I will let you back into Texas A&M, and I will give you the Presidential Achievement Award, which is a $10,000 scholarship. I did it. I did it. I did it. Because I want it better. I want it greater. So I went back to Texas A&M with the scholarship, And fast forward, December 18th, 1992, I became the first person in my family to graduate from college. Immediately after that, I began to work as an instructional paraprofessional in Bryan ISD while I was working on my teacher certification. I assisted students that needed help with their GED and credit recovery. When I completed my teaching certificate, Bryan ISD hired me on full time at Bryan High School, and I became a US history teacher and a world history teacher. But I still want it better. I still want it greater. I instilled in each and every one of my students that guiding principle of better and greater. My professors from the university, Dr. David Erlinson, Dr. John Hall, and I don't know why, but Dr. Woodrow Jones, they called me back and they said, Gina, you need to go to graduate school. So my second year teaching history, I began to work on my master's of educational administration. I graduated 18 months later, December 1996, cum laude, <laughs> cum laude from Texas A&M <laughs> with a 3.78 GPA, me, yeah. So again, wanting to be, do better wanting to do greater. My mother, she never had the opportunity to see me become the department chair at Plummer Middle School, teacher of the year at Plummer Middle School, testing coordinator at Hall Academy, 
testing coordinator at Shotwell Academy, curriculum assistant principal at Grantham Academy, or the building principal of Ruby Reed Academy for engineering. At 5.41 p.m. Monday, September 25th, 2006, I received a phone call from my oldest sister, Marie. And that phone call shocked my world, turned it upside down. And she said, Gina, mama's gone. And I thank God for my husband and my in-laws for being that force, that strength for me. But I continued somewhere deep within. I could hear and feel my mother saying, girl, this is what you wanted. Do better, get up, do greater, do better, do greater. And I remember five months before she passed, I drove her to Jasper, Texas to pick up her medication because Warren was this little country town and we didn't have the pharmacy and all of that. So we had to drive the 43 miles to Jasper to pick up her medication. And I came out of the pharmacy store, got into the car and was getting ready to drive back to Warren. And she got my right hand and squeezed it. And she said, Gina, I am so proud of you. I've always been proud of you, but I'm even more proud of you because you chose to do better. You chose to do greater. So her story became my story and her song became my song. This is my story. This it's my song, looking for greater all day long. This is my story. This, mama, is our song, looking for greater all day long. Principal of Ruby Reed Academy, Ms. Gina Morrison Adams. And that, folks, is hopefully going to let, let you walk out of here tonight inspired to get up tomorrow, go to work, and do something for one, just pick one of your students and make their day. I want to take this opportunity to thank the school board, Dr. Bamberg, Dr. Blanson, Dr. Sarah Tomey, Executive Director Akila Willery, and Dr. Michael Ann Kelly for supporting us. I want to thank the crew of the Aldine Broadcast Network. They're back there running this live so that everybody at home can see. And I want to see everybody back here next year, whether you're on this stage telling your story or you found someone who's inspired you and you've asked them to tell theirs. Everybody have a safe trip home tonight and thank you for being here. Don't forget to pick up a certificate for some CPE credit on the table if you'd like. And